Today, I thought I'd do a deep dive into the jackets worn by women in the 17th century. Who wore them? Where were they worn? When were they worn? Who made them? And what were they made of? Before I begin, I should clarify. When I say jackets, I'm talking about the garments that were known in the 17th century as waistcoats, but since museums seem to refer to them all indiscriminately as waistcoats, bodices and jackets, I thought I'd just refer to all of them as jackets for the sake of clarity. It's also partly on account of the fact that should you say waistcoats to anyone today, they would probably envision a sleeveless garment. Women of poorer sorts wore jackets throughout the 16th century, throughout much of Western Europe. They were cheaper than a gown, since they used less material, but they could still keep you quite warm, and if you were particularly cold and had enough money, you could then wear a gown over the top for extra warmth and insulation. There were various forms of jacket worn by working women. One sort was a loose jacket, thanks to the fact that it falls straight from the shoulder. It's quite good if your body shape is often changing, or if you're frequently going through pregnancy, as many women in the 16th century were. Another jacket was shorter, tighter fitting. Um, I'm afraid I've only got part of it, thanks to the fact that the woman is running part way out of the picture. The picture in question is the painting of the Massacre of the Innocents by Bruegel, which isn't the most cheerful of topics, but it's also quite useful for looking at the clothing of common women in the 16th century. Anyway, this jacket stops at the waist, so it uses even less fabric than one of the longer, looser jackets. But despite this, it can still provide quite a lot of warmth, something which I've found from having worn one at the Tudor recreations at Kentwell Hall. Other jackets are depicted as being fitted from the shoulders to the waist and then loose over the hips. They don't have any gauze though, they're simply cut so that they're wider at the bottom. As with the other jackets, they're front fastening, though whether they did up with hooks and eyes or pins, it's difficult to tell in these paintings. Many of them also had collars or cuffs, but they're optional and not all of the jackets have both or either. This jacket is perhaps more familiar, there are more ornate versions of it shown in portraiture and extant examples. It's very fitted, with gauze flaring out over the hips. This picture is interesting in that it gives us a back view, so we can see that there are these two strips of fabric at the centre back. Their purpose is probably going to remain permanently a mystery, but I would guess that it's probably to make it easier to let the jacket in or out, as changing body shapes required. Another interesting thing about this picture is that it shows us patches on her shoulder and at her elbow, which possibly imply that those are the places where the jacket was worn down more easily or more quickly. Either way, it's interesting to see how the repairs were done. Unfortunately, no extant 16th century working class jackets still exist on account of the fact that they were worn to rags. The earliest working class jacket in a museum that I can find is a French revolutionary's jacket from around about 1790 to 1800, I'll put the link below. It's interesting because it's got the cheaper wool hemp mix fabric at the back, and then it's got more expensive wool fabric at the front, where it was more likely to be seen. Anyway, that was completely off topic. Um, back on topic to jackets, 16th century jackets. For the middling sort of woman, jackets could be best wear. If she didn't have enough money for an ornate gown, but she was able to embroider her own jacket or pay for somebody else to embroider her jacket, then that was often a very good option. We will see some beautifully ornate gowns later, but those were the preserve of the nobility and the aristocracy. Though, middling sorts and working sorts could have a less ornate gown for warmth and practicality rather than formality. The embroidery on middle class jackets could vary from very simple wool on linen to the far more expensive silk and gilt threads that were more akin to the jackets the aristocracy were also wearing. This mainly depended on how much money she had and how much importance she put on the jacket. Where the middling sorts were wearing their jackets as best wear, the higher gentry, the nobility and the aristocracy didn't really wear the jackets in the same way. For them, jackets weren't really best wear, you wouldn't go to church on a Sunday wearing just your jacket. They were more for lounging around the house as informal undress wear. You certainly wouldn't go to court wearing your jacket, except on the occasion of court masks. But court masks are slightly different to your normal formal day at court. 
Something which I should have probably mentioned earlier is that embroidered jackets are uniquely English. Fashion was quite slow and distinct for different countries throughout the 16th and 17th century in Europe, and all of the extant jackets appear to be English made from England, and all of the portraits in which embroidered jackets are depicted also seem to be of English people in England. Jackets didn't really catch on with the English upper classes until the very late 16th to early 17th century, where they began to be worn as undress wear in informal settings. This portrait of Elizabeth Vernon from around about 1600 is really, really informal. She's wearing her jacket open over her stays as she's brushing her hair. The jacket's quite typical in that it's got this swirling naturalistic floral embroidery. It's got a deep v-neckline, which is seen in some of the other jackets and portraiture of the time. The zigzag hem is quite unusual. I haven't seen that on any other extant jackets or in any other portraiture. However, since a lot of the portraiture simply stops at the waist, then it's sometimes difficult to tell what the hem of the jacket would have been. There are also ties going all the way down the sleeves, and a lot of ties at the front, which is probably how it fastened. I can't say I've seen ties on any of the sleeves of other jackets of that time. Another portrait which has a jacket worn open over the stays is this one of Frances Howard. While the jacket isn't the most obvious thing in the portrait, the deep brown neckline is quite typical of some of the slightly later embroidered jackets. The embroidered facings are also interesting. Where the jacket's hanging open, it seems that the inside is embroidered as well as the outside, though it could have just been the painter's fancy. The most common form of gown shown in portraiture is fitted and worn under a gown. There are gauze flowing over the hips and relatively tight sleeves. Some have ties at the front, some don't, they seem to be optional. The gowns tend also to be highly decorated and as such would have been worn in more formal settings than simply the jacket on its own. However, if you didn't have the money for an embroidered jacket and a heavily embellished gown, and the more formal gown was your priority, you could cheat. 17th Century Women's Dress Patterns Book 1 shows a set of embroidered sleeve fronts and a partlet which could have been slotted underneath the gown to give the appearance of wearing a jacket, as the woman in this portrait could have done. In terms of evolution, the jackets changed along with the rest of the fashions of the time. As necklines fell and waistlines rose on women's bodices, they did much the same thing on women's jackets. However, the jackets were not always directly altered so as to fit in with the current fashions. The survival of Margaret Leighton's jacket, along with the portrait of her wearing it, shows that all that she's done is pull her petticoat over the jacket to give the illusion of a higher waistline. The jacket's waistline hasn't been altered at all. Many fashions existed simultaneously, since fashion changed very slowly. The first fashion magazine wasn't until the late 17th century. While Margaret Leighton's jacket wasn't altered, there are other jackets that were clearly made or altered to fit with the current fashions, as in this portrait. The boat neckline and the high waist all point towards the fashions of the 1630s, and it wouldn't have been massively difficult to alter a jacket by cutting down the neckline and raising the waist. This jacket may have been made at the time in order to fit with the fashions, but the tight sleeves are not at all like the slightly shorter, puffier sleeves of the 1630s, which makes me think it's feasible that this could have been an earlier jacket that was then altered. These sleeves are more akin to the typical sleeves of the 1630s, with the puffiness and the shortening. I'm not sure whether to categorise this as a bodice or a jacket on account of the lack of the integral sleeves and the fact that it fastens over a stomacher. Perhaps it could have been an altered jacket. You can see bits of embroidered sleeve at the top of the shoulders, and more of those could have been cut off and used to make the stomacher. Likewise, where the gauze are could have simply been cut up further into the waistline in order to make the tabs. Whether it was an altered jacket or whether it was made specifically for the 1630s, I don't think we'll ever know, though. From the 1630s onwards, such embroidered jackets seem to decline in portraiture, which potentially indicates that they were less fashionable. 
However, despite the lack of evidence in portraiture, there are extant examples from the 1640s of embroidered fitted jackets with gauze and with shorter puffy sleeves. Lots of these are in the V&A, which means I'm afraid I can't show them to you on account of copyright, but there's a link below if you want to go and investigate. A reason to leave some jackets unaltered, especially the looser, less fashionable ones that aren't really seen in portraiture, could be that they were worn as pregnancy wear, like in this portrait said to be of Anne of Denmark. Another jacket in the V&A collections, which is loose and was possibly pregnancy wear, but I'm afraid I also can't show it to you because of copyright, there's another link below though. A lot of the extant jackets we do have don't survive in their original form, thanks to the fact that they are often altered for court mask wear. Masks were entertainments at court which involved singing, dancing, acting and music. They also had elaborate costume and set designs. Generally, they were in the form of an allegory in honour of the patron of the mask, often in England, Anne of Denmark, who utterly adored them. The speaking and singing parts were generally played by hired professional actors, with members of the court filling in the rest of the parts. As such, the drapery worn in these portraits of women in mask costumes would not have been daily wear. The jackets themselves tended to have the necklines cut down, so that they are more in keeping with the current fashions, and since embroidery was not all that visible in the candlelight used to illuminate the masks, they were often covered with spangles, to the extent that the embroidery is almost invisible. Spangles are small, flat metal sequins. There's one jacket in the V&A Museum so covered with spangles that it can barely be moved from its drawer, since every time it's moved even slightly, more spangles fall off. There seems to be something of a rise in what might be called embroidered jackets towards the end of the 17th century, but since they were worn by women as riding wear, and more widely than just England, it's more likely that they stemmed from the fashion for men's embroidered coats of the time, rather than being a continuation of the earlier embroidered jackets. These jackets are made of a whole variety of things, so I'll take you through a few extant ones one by one, so you can see all the different methods and materials. All of the following ones are from the Met Museum, if you want to go and have a look for them. This example, from between 1600 and 1625, is very simply embroidered wool on linen, lined in silk. The large, sparse, swirling flowers could well have been embroidered at home, by a woman who had commissioned a tailor to draw out the jacket pattern onto some linen for her, and then had him construct it for her after she'd finished embroidering it. The simple materials mean that this could well have been owned by a woman of far less means than the ones in the earlier portraits, but without the provenance it's impossible to tell. The pattern seems unusual on account of the fact that it's far less dense than the majority of examples of 17th century embroidery, but perhaps whoever embroidered it didn't like embroidering. While not jackets, these are some other examples of relatively simple 17th century embroidery. This one's a hunting scene, all executed very densely in the same red silk thread, while this one seems to be grapes or flowers in red silk with gilt thread. Similar designs exist on jackets in portraiture, and these would not have been nearly so difficult to execute as the other polychrome silks with gilt threads and spangles. In the 17th century women's dress patterns book, there's an unusual jacket that's made of silk rather than the more common linen, and embroidered in couched silk thread and decorated further with silver spangles. There are lots of pictures of it on the v &A website if you want to have a look. This jacket fits in with the stereotypical early 17th century embroidered jackets, with naturalistic flowers and insects all interacting between gold swirling stems. A whole variety of different stitches were used in these sorts of jackets. There are many, many different braid stitches that can be used for the stems, while the filling stitches for the flowers are even more numerous. Many of these jackets are, or were, decorated with metallic gold and silver laces at the cuffs, the hem, the collar, the wings over the sleeves and the front fastening, though not necessarily all of these on a single jacket. Not all extant jackets retain such lace, however, thanks to the fact that it was easy to pick off and reuse. Gold and silk threads were, funnily enough, very expensive, so the stitches that were used to embroider the jackets tend towards keeping as much of the thread on the right side of the fabric as possible, so that it can be seen. Comparing the back and the front of the sleeve panel illustrates this beautifully. Something that may come as a surprise is the fact that not all jackets were embroidered onto woven fabric. 
Knitter's jackets survive in extant forms, but are not really depicted in portraits at all. Perhaps they were too informal. Either way, the beautifully knitted silk jackets are far outside of my remit. I can't knit to save my life, but perhaps somebody else might like them as a project. As I've briefly touched upon, jackets could be made by a combination of people. There are professional tailors who generally carry out the pattern making and construction, while professional embroiderers carried out the embroidery, working with the incredibly valuable gilt threads, which are silk threads which had a thin strip of gold coiled around them. From contemporary depictions of them, it seemed that they worked in front of windows to take full advantage of the natural light, and worked their embroidery going away from them so as not to get in their own way. Apparently modern embroidery is done working towards yourself, but from personal experimentation I found it far easier to work away from myself. However, embroidery could also be done in the home by richer women as a form of productive recreation. At least one extant jacket appears to have been made entirely by somebody who didn't really know what they were doing. The shapes of the pattern pieces used, the quality of the embroidery and the fact that it has never been lined all point towards it having been made by an amateur. Thanks to the printing press, both professionals and amateurs had access to pattern books, which provided images which could be used in embroidery and lace making, though, thanks to the low literacy rate of their intended audience, they did not provide instructions on how to use the patterns in their books, on the basis that it would be pointless. As a quick tangent, while embroidered jackets were pretty much universally English, the Dutch, whose lower classes also wore jackets throughout the 16th century, took to wearing jackets as a fashion as well, though in a slightly different way. By the 1630s and 1640s, another form of jacket had taken off. Much like the English version, it was relatively informal. However, it was much more loose-fitting and seems to have been almost universally lined, or faced at least, with white fur. They exist throughout Dutch genre paintings of the mid-17th century in a whole rainbow of colours, and the majority seem to have been made of an unembellished silk satin. Anyway, having drifted off on that tangent, I should probably stop there. Embroidered 17th century jackets are stunningly beautiful, and there are so many still extant in museums. I'll leave a collection of links below for you to go and see some more pretty sparkly things, and get on with making my own.